Why are we here? Why is there something instead of nothing? Who made, Who all, made all this? Where did it come from? Where did it, Where come, did it come from? from? Where did it come from? What does the Bible say? What does Who the Bible made all what does the Bible say? What do I believe? Belief is when you know something is true. If you can see something with your eyes, like a person, place, or thing, then it's easy to believe that it's there. You can feel it with your hands. You can describe it to someone else and they can believe in it too. But what about something you can't see with your eyes or touch with your hands? Things like happiness, anger, or love. Those things are still real, and even though we can't really see them, we still believe they exist. And even though we can't touch them, they're still really powerful. Belief is really powerful too. When you believe in something, it's more than just knowing or feeling it. Belief will change your actions and the way you make choices. In fact, your beliefs can change your whole life. The Bible tells us a lot about God, that He made us, loves us, and sent Jesus for us. And believing in Jesus is a big deal. Even if you can't see Jesus physically, you can believe in Him. And that belief can change your whole life too. Now, belief doesn't mean you never have any questions. In fact, you might have a ton of questions about the Bible, God, or Jesus. That's totally cool. God gave us brains so we could use them to think, ask questions, and learn. When we choose to believe even when we have questions, that's called faith. The Bible says, faith is being sure of what we hope for. It is being sure of what we do not see. Another way of saying this is, faith is when we believe something even if we have questions. So today, we're going to ask the question, why are we here? Hey, I'm Chris from Kids Club, and if I'm honest, sometimes I even wonder, why am I here? Why are any of us here? Why is there an Earth, a Sun, galaxies, antelopes, artichokes? I could go on. The short version is we're here because God made us. Now, you might have heard some of the story of God creating the world before in seven days, starting with God saying, let there be light. And then he says, it is good. And then water, land, plants, animals, people, male and female, made in God's image. Whew. And yep, that's all right there in the Bible in Genesis 1 and 2. Oh, right there. See? Everything exists because it was created, and it was created by a creator, God. Now, that's the short version. The slightly longer version is... Well, it gets complicated because it's easy to get distracted by some of the weird details in the story. Like, was it literally seven days or was it more like billions of years? Or are humans really made out of dirt or trillions of tiny particles called atoms and molecules? And speaking of atoms, did Adam ever get to ride on a Tyrannosaurus Rex? Because if you ever get a chance to ride a T-Rex, you ride the T-Rex. I mean, that's just a given. But the thing is, that's not what Genesis is trying to tell us. Yep, believe it or not, the Bible is not a textbook. It's, well, it's the Bible. <laughs> Although, both textbooks and the Bible are heavy. <laughs> they got a lot of pages. Woo! And the Bible was inspired by God, but the people who wrote the Bible and the people listening to the story probably didn't know about atoms <laughs> and molecules and dark matter black holes like we do today. Otherwise, they might have mentioned them. The point is that science and the Bible are not enemies. They can actually be, like, friends. Aww. They just tell us different things about creation. See, science tells us how things are made. Chemical reactions, and electricity, and gravity, and physics. And that's amazing good stuff to know. It helps us to fight diseases and to invent things like refrigerators and video games and supersonic rocket ships that can travel to Mars and to figure out how to make a hamburger that isn't a hamburger but tastes exactly like a hamburger. Mmm, impossible burger. And we should believe science because remember it helps us to understand how the world works. And we can also believe the Bible because the Bible helps us to understand why the world works. It's because God is really good at making things that work. 
He's the designer behind everything we could discover. He created science and math. He has ultimate control and authority. And not only is he really good at making things, but he's also just really good, like super awesomely good. He says it like six times in Genesis. After he makes something, he takes a look at it and he goes, wow, that is good. And then when he makes people, he takes a look and he's like, wow, those human beings right there, they are really good. And that's because you and I are made in God's image. <laughs> <laughs> and what does that mean to be made in God's image? Well, I could try to explain it, but this video will do a way better job. Let's check it out. God's story. God made people. So part of God's story is about how he made people. And it goes like this. The very beginning of time, God made the world. And he did it just by speaking. He made the blue sky and planets with rings and galaxies exploding with stars. He made puffy clouds and dry land and sparkling water. He covered the earth with deserts and mountains and planted forests and jungles. He sprinkled the world with flowers and bugs and birds and fish and animals of all kinds. It was a perfect home full of fun creatures. And God called all of it good, but he wasn't done creating yet. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This time though, God didn't just speak. First, he took some dust from the ground. Then he breathed into the dust with his own breath. By doing that, he created the very first person, a man called Adam. God put Adam in an amazing garden called Eden. But Adam was different than the other living creatures God had made. In fact, God put Adam in charge of everything else. But Adam needed a friend. So the Bible says that God caused him to fall into a deep sleep. While Adam was sleeping, God made a woman from one of Adam's ribs. Her name was Eve. And she and Adam were free to live happily in the garden where they could walk and talk with God. It was perfect. Once Adam and Eve were together caring for the garden, God didn't just call the world good, he called it very good. See, people are God's favorite. Remember, we were made in his own image, in his likeness. The Bible says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We don't know exactly what it means to be created in God's image. But we do know it means he made us like him. So our eyes, our skin, our teeth, our bones are perfectly crafted by God. Our personalities, our sense of humor, our sensitivities, our hobbies, our talents, everything is made by God so that we can be like him. And we have abilities that none of the animals have. We can paint pictures and write poems. We can solve math problems, explain what we're thinking, and invent cool new things. Whether we like to run, teach, build, or anything else, God understands us. Of course, we don't always act perfectly, but that's another part of the story. When God made Adam and Eve, he crafted them in his image. He made them, and us, like him. And that's the story of how God made people. So, in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God made the whole world. It was a perfect home. He called it good. He breathed into dust and made Adam. He took one of Adam's ribs and made Eve. Then he called the world very good. He made us like him, in his image. He understands us, and we are his favorite. And that's a part of God's story. Well, there you have it. The big question, why are we here, has been answered. Hallelujah! We can all go home now! JK, we have to be at home right now, am I right? Pound it out. But it's not that simple, is it? Because sometimes the answer to one big question just leads to another big question, which leads to an even bigger question until you're just like... Bruh. And that's
that's okay. Remember, belief is when you know something is true, but faith is when you choose to believe even if you still have questions. Take this hamburger, for example. Like, I believe this hamburger is actually not made of meat. It's called an impossible burger because it's almost impossible to tell the difference between this burger and one made of actual meat. But I still have questions. Like, okay, if it's not made of meat, what's the point again? And who even comes up with stuff like this? Or take atoms and molecules. I believe they exist even though I've never actually seen one with my eyes. It's actually impossible to see them because they move so fast and they're so tiny. But I've seen drawings and microscope images, and I trust people who are way smarter than I am who tell me that molecules and atoms exist, and I believe them. But I still have questions like, so how do we know they exist? And how do they like stick together? Do they hold the secret of time travel? I still have questions, but I choose to believe anyway. Same thing with believing God created everything. You can still believe that's true while having a bazillion questions about creation and humanity and even God. See, God gave you a brain so you could ask questions and learn. He loves when you use your brain to learn more about him. Actually, that's a verse we're trying to learn this week and you can say it with me. Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those who come to God must believe that he exists and they must believe that he rewards those who look to him. So hey, if you're a person like me who has tons of questions, that verse is good news. It means that if we keep asking God our big questions, he rewards us for looking to him for answers. And that means you can look to him for answers too. You can actually do that right now. See, one great way to ask God your big questions is to actually write them down. And my friend Jen is going to show us how she writes down some of her big questions. Maybe some of these questions are big questions you have too. Hi, I'm Jen. Ever since I was a kid, I've always had lots of questions. You know, we're different, but we probably have that in common. We all wonder, we all have questions for God. Questions like, why am I here? And what's my purpose? What's my future gonna look like? Why am I different? And for me, it's, why am I little? So I still have lots of questions and I found a way to process them by writing them out and turning them into something beautiful. So I learned how to do calligraphy, which is just beautiful handwriting, but I love it. And when I write this way, it forces me to slow down. And when I write out my questions, then I know exactly what I want to talk to God about. Because I know that whatever questions I have, God can handle it and he loves to hear from me. Hey, I'm Chris from Kids Club, and when I've got a lot on my mind, it helps me to get outside and go for a walk. This is a nature trail near my home, and it's actually the perfect spot to come and think, because there's just something about nature, the big trees, fresh air, rocky rocks, and yucky roots, that, I don't know, it helps me to clear my mind. Now, I'm a grown-up, spoiler alert, I know, but still, I've got questions. Why are there diseases and viruses in the world? Why do people get sick and die? Why do we have unpleasant emotions like anger and sadness? Why do we sometimes get into fights with people? Sometimes even people we love. Now, maybe you have some of those same questions too. And if you do, you're in because the right today, place. Because today, we're going to try to find some answers to that big question, why do bad things happen? And the short answer is that bad things happen in the world because people make wrong choices. 
The Bible now, calls it sin. Now, you might have heard the story before that we call the fall, about how Adam and Eve, the first people, made the first wrong choice in the history of everything. God said, eat any fruit of any tree in the whole Garden of Eden, except the fruit from this one tree, because if they ate from it, then they would surely die. And one day the serpent tricked Eve into eating the fruit, and then Adam did too, and then God kicked them out of the garden, and then death came into the world. And yep, that's all right there in the Bible, in Genesis 3. Right, May? Huh? Oh, yeah, right there, Genesis 3. And then in Romans 3, it says, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. So there you have it. The slightly longer version is, yep, it gets complicated. You probably know that wrong choices have negative consequences. And like the roots of this tree, the one wrong choice of Adam and Eve ended up growing and spreading. And not only did it infect people's physical bodies and their hearts, but it also infected creation itself. Talk about an epic fail, am I right? All the good, beautiful things God made, plants, animals, and even the earth itself, all of it was affected by their wrong choice. That's why trees eventually rot or fall down or get struck by lightning. That's why some animals kill and eat other animals. It's also why all over the world there are earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, and avalanches. Overwhelmed yet? Just wait. Because not only did Adam and Eve sin, but so does everyone. Whether it's disobeying the rules, telling a lie, or hurting another person, or digging a hole straight down in Minecraft. Oh! I mean, who even does that? Everyone messes up sometimes. You, me, the people you love, at some point, everyone makes at least one wrong choice. And when people make wrong choices, it can lead to all kinds of really awful things like pain, war, hunger, and even death. Now, if that were the end of the story, then that means all you and I would ever be able to look forward to is bad news, and more bad news, and even worse news. But here's the thing, that's not the end of the story. There's actually a lot of good news as well. And you know, I could keep talking about it, but here's a video that's gonna do a way better job than I could. Let's watch it together. God's story, the good news. So part of God's story is about the gospel or the good news. And it goes like this. In the beginning, God made everything. The sun, the moon, stars, planets, the entire galaxy and Earth was part of that creation. God made mountains and oceans and forests and deserts and animals that crawled on the ground and flew in the air and swam in the water. Then he made people, Adam and Eve, to live in a garden called Eden. And God called everything he had made good. There was just one rule. Adam and Eve could eat anything they wanted except for the fruit from this one tree. But a snake tricked Adam and Eve into disobeying that one rule. Because of that, sickness, sadness, and all kinds of bad things came into God's perfect creation, all because people made wrong choices. Part of how God punished Adam and Eve was by not allowing them in the perfect garden anymore. And if that were the end of the story, that would be bad news for us. That would mean all the wrong stuff in the world would never be made right. But God still loved people, and he had good news for them. He was going to send a rescuer. So they waited, and waited, and waited. Then one day, the rescuer was born as a baby named Jesus. Christmas is when we celebrate the good news of Jesus being born. But it's not just that he was born, it's what he did later that was the best news of all. He took the punishment for all the wrong choices that anyone has ever made anywhere. See, all of us have continued to make wrong choices, just like Adam and Eve did. And just like Adam and Eve, we deserve to be punished for our wrong choices. But here's the thing, Jesus the rescuer never made a single bad choice. Kids, think about a time you made a bad choice. Maybe telling a lie, or taking something that wasn't yours, or hurting another person with something you did or said. Can you believe that whatever that was, Jesus never made a choice like that? And even though he never made a bad choice, he still took the punishment for our wrong choices? 
And then Jesus did something even more completely unexpected. He came back to life. Really, you can read about it in the Bible, in the stories written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We call those books Gospels, which is just an old fancy word for, you guessed it, the good news of Jesus coming to earth, dying for our wrong choices, and coming back to life. That's what we celebrate on Easter. But not just because coming back to life is totally amazing. By coming back to life, Jesus was showing that God can make anything new. There's nothing God can't do. He's more powerful than any sadness, shame, wrong choice, disease, disaster, and even death. And that's the best, most amazing good news of all. It's so amazing, Jesus' friends told everyone they could find about the good news. And those people told other people. And those people told other people. And on and on. And that's still happening today. In fact, you just heard the good news. And the Bible says, Ahem. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's another way to say God rescues us. And that rescue includes you, your friends, your family, and anyone else in the whole world. And that's the story of the good news. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God made a perfect world. People made mistakes and the world isn't perfect anymore. God promised his family a rescuer. The rescuer's name is Jesus. Jesus died to take a punishment we deserve, but he didn't stay dead. Jesus came back to life because Jesus can make anything new. And that's a part of God's story. Okay, so there we have it. The big question, why do bad things happen, has not only been answered, but now we know Jesus came to rescue us and God gives us the choice to receive that rescue. Ah, uh, yeah. Which might make you wonder some other big questions, like I know God is good and I'm grateful that God made a plan to rescue us, but why would God even give us the choice to do something not good in the first place? Wouldn't this all have been easier without giving freedom to human beings? We call that free will. If we didn't have free will, then we'd be sort of like robots. We'd never do anything wrong or unexpected because we'd be like programmed. Huh. Weird, right? But it's okay to think about it. I was actually talking with my friend John the other day about robots and artificial intelligence, and we decided to try an experiment. It involves free will, a kid named Nick, and something or someone named Siri and Alexa. John, take it away. How's it going? Good. Good to see you, but it looks like our wall backgrounds are almost the same. I just, I just didn't notice that. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm John. And I'm Nick. So we were trying to figure out basically, uh, one, could we stump either Siri or Nick has? An Alexa. Yeah, we're trying to figure out if, if we can stump them with questions. Can you see my phone screen there? Okay. Um, I actually never used an Alexa. What, what do I say for Alexa? Just say her name. Alexa. Hey, Alexa. Oh no, I have headphones on. <laughs> uh, we asked them each like a really simple question that we figured out both Nick and I know, which is how many days are in April? Alexa, how many days are in April? This year, April has 30 days. I'll try it with this one. Let's, let's see. How many days are in April? It's 359 days until then. So a word off can just stump anything. How far away is May 7th? It was one year ago. Like super simple. You were saying like, it could be like in hours, minutes. Like that's the kind of thing that blows my mind, right? This is supposed yeah. to be like, have access to literally anything smart in the whole world. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? About as much ground as a ground hog could hog, a ground hog could hog ground. How about another tongue twister? How far away is May 7th? May 7th will start in five hours, 46 minutes. Yay! 43 seconds. <laughs>
I think that one we have to give to Alexa for sure. Oh, she, she. <laughs> she knows we're talking about her. I'll ask, I'll ask Siri again. How many days are in April? It's 359 days until then. It's definitely not the right answer. My question to you, if you had a choice, would you be a person or would you be a robot? A person. If I was an AI, I couldn't have opinions about anything. And I wouldn't, I couldn't be mad, but I would be very mad. Alexa, thanks for your help. You bet. Thanks for your help, Siri. You're welcome. Alexa, why? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Thanks, John, Nick, Siri, and Alexa. That was hilarious, actually. So even an AI with pre-programmed answers can still mess up. You know, while I was watching that, I got to thinking that I'm glad we have free will. Like, being a robot would be cool for a while. Our robots all belong to us. But after a while, it would get pretty lame. Without free will, I'd never get to pick my favorite ice cream, or toppings on pizza, or what game to play with my family. Actually, I don't even think you can play a game if there aren't choices, because that's kind of all a game is, is choices about what pieces to move or what cards to play. A world without free will is a world without games. A world without free will is also a world where human beings are basically slaves. I mean, slavery is what happens when you take freedom away. That's why I'm grateful to God for giving us free will, even if it means there's some bad stuff in the world. And after all, when something bad happens, it's also a chance for people to make good, right choices that help others. I'm also grateful for God's forgiveness because I know I've made wrong choices. I've disobeyed my parents. I've disobeyed God. I've known the right choice to make and then I just didn't do it. I've even taken things that aren't mine. I've told lies. I've hurt people. So I need God's forgiveness just as much as Adam and Eve did. The Bible actually says God wants to forgive us. That's a verse we're trying to learn this week and you can say it with me. It's 2 Peter 3, 9. God is patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. Instead, he wants all people to turn away from their sins. You might be thinking about a wrong choice you made recently. It's okay to talk about things that we've done wrong, and it's really good to ask for forgiveness. Let's do that together. Let's pray. God, I know I've made wrong choices. I know I've messed up and need your forgiveness. Please forgive me for the wrong things I've said or done. Forgive me for the times I've known the right thing to do, but didn't do it. And if there's someone else I need to ask for forgiveness, please give me the chance and the courage. When I was a little kid, I was always really interested in all those cool stories that I heard and read in the Bible about Jesus. How he was born on Christmas, how he healed the sick, fed 5,000 people, cast out demons, and even that he died and came back to life. But I always wondered, okay, those stories are great, but why did Jesus do that stuff? Maybe you're wondering that too, and that's okay. God gave you a brain so that you could ask questions and learn more about him. And when you believe, even if you have questions, that's called faith. Now, one of my favorite places to go when I'm thinking really big thoughts like this is right here. The scenery is really cool and there's this ravine, a sort of a small valley, where I think there used to be a huge river, but now there's just a bunch of mud and some rocks. Oh, there's a plane literally taking off. Not only does it look really cool, but it has something to do with the big question we're asking today. Why did Jesus come to earth? The short answer is Jesus came to earth to rescue God's creation. Do do do! Ha ha! Now, you might have heard some of the story about Jesus' rescue before. How God made a perfect world, but then people made wrong choices or sinned. And the world isn't perfect anymore. God made a rescue plan to save people and redeem all of creation by sending his son, Jesus. Do do do! Ha ha! And yep, that's all right there in the Bible. Uh, right, May? What's that? Oh, hey, Chris. Yep, you're right. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now, if you'll excuse me. Thanks, May. Good luck doing whatever that was. It's like a loon. Uh -huh. So Jesus was God's son, and he was sent to earth to rescue all of us. Every boy, girl, woman, and man. Everyone. 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 
Now, that's the short answer. The slightly longer answer is, well, it's a little complicated. Jesus is God's son, but he didn't show up on Earth in like a cosmic UFO with blinking lights or in a lightning bolt that scorched the ground. <laughs> he didn't show up as a powerful warrior with a big parade and lots of people cheering. <laughs> nope. Jesus came to Earth as a baby. Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. A cute, cuddly baby with stinky diapers. Except they didn't have diapers yet. Who needed someone to feed him and clothe him and burp him and teach him how to walk and talk? Ooh, ooh, ooh. I mean, think about this. Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, had to teach Jesus about God and God's rescue plan. They had to teach him about the Creator, which was himself. Weird, right? But it's true! Jesus didn't automatically know how to do all the amazing things he did. He had to learn it. Yes, he did. He had to learn to use his body and his brain. He was like us, which is nuts! Because why would God take the form of a human being when human beings were the ones who messed up in the first place? Wouldn't it be easier to show up as God and start waving around your magic God hands and fixing everything? Now, let's imagine something for a little bit in Minecraft. Oh, cool! It worked! Okay, so imagine you had created a world, the best, most incredible world possible. Everything works and everyone's happy. But once you leave creative mode, it's harder to keep your world intact. Something goes wrong and starts to destroy your creation. And then it's all survival mode. Now things are breaking down and they're falling apart. People are sad and frustrated and it's all getting ruined. If you as the creator wanted to fix everything, wouldn't you just stay in creative mode? Then you could make it stop raining, for starters. And then you could move on to rebuilding everything. You could be in charge. You would have total control over every detail, and you'd be powerful. You could even, uh, fly! <laughs> and if you wanted to, you could ban other characters from your world, so you wouldn't have to deal with anyone else anymore. And if you wanted to, you could even restart the game. Just go to the menu and delete this world and then start over from scratch. So think about it. If you had to rebuild everything, would you send a baby to do a builder's job? No way. I know I would never think that the answer to fixing the world was to send a baby. A baby can't be in charge of anything. A baby can't build stuff. A baby can't change the weather. A baby wouldn't be helpful. It would be helpless, especially in Minecraft. But that's what God did in the real world. He sent his son Jesus not as an adult or as a general or as a ruler. Jesus came into the world as a baby. And because of that, Jesus was like us. Now I could go on and on, but this video does a way better job than I could. Let's watch together. God's story. Jesus was like us. So part of God's story is about his son named Jesus. It goes like this. Even though Jesus is God, he's also like us too. You might have already heard some stories about Jesus. Some stories are really famous, like how Jesus was born at Christmas, or how he died on a cross and then came back to life on Easter. You also might have heard that Jesus taught big crowds or made sick people feel better and healed them. He did do all those things. But that's not all there is to know about Jesus. He also did a lot of normal stuff, like help his mom with chores, play with his brothers and sisters, maybe even snored. The Bible never actually says Jesus snored, but it does say he was like us. Anyway, one normal thing we know Jesus liked for sure was being with his friends. Kids, do you like to hang out with friends? You probably have friends who like to play different things. Maybe some of your friends like to play video games. Some go swimming or to the playground. Some like to chase around fake aliens with lasers. The really fun thing about friends is being together, no matter what you're playing. Well, Jesus spent a lot of time with friends. He would go over to their houses a lot just to hang out and usually eat some food. They sometimes went fishing or rode on a boat. Jesus had 12 best friends. They were called his disciples. A disciple is anyone who follows Jesus. We can be disciples too if we follow him. And the really cool thing is Jesus wants to be friends with us and everybody. And we know that because he was always making new friends. He even made friends with people nobody else liked because Jesus likes everyone. If Jesus wasn't with his friends, he might have been doing a normal thing like resting. This one day, Jesus was so tired that he took a nap on a boat and he didn't even wake up when a huge storm came. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night because you heard thunder and lightning? 
Well, imagine how scary it would be if your whole bed was jumping up and down too. Not you jumping up and down on your bed, the bed jumping up and down on the floor. That's what it felt like for Jesus in that boat. But he was so tired, he was sleeping right through. Jesus knew God was with him, so he could sleep even during a storm. And he knew it's important to rest when you're tired. Sometimes Jesus rested by going somewhere by himself so he could talk to God. One place he really liked going was into a garden. Picture sitting under a big tree in the shade or climbing your favorite tree. We don't know if Jesus liked climbing trees, but we do know that Jesus liked to be alone to pray and that sometimes he prayed outside. You also might not have known that Jesus loved going to parties. Think about the parties you've been to. Birthday parties, Christmas parties. You're not the only one there, right? Usually lots of people go because parties are a way for us to celebrate something really cool with people we care about. Jesus loved doing that too. Once, Jesus went to a wedding with his family and friends, but right in the middle of the reception, the wine ran out. There was only water left. Jesus saved the day by turning that water into wine. It was his first miracle. A miracle is when something amazing happens that only God can do. When Jesus did this miracle, the people at the party were able to keep right on having a good time. Jesus played with his friends, rested, and celebrated many times in the Bible. We just don't talk about those things as often because they're regular activities that regular people, like you and me, do all the time. But even though Jesus was the Son of God and able to heal sick people and tell amazing stories to huge crowds, he was also a lot like us. And that's part of the story of Jesus. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Jesus was born on Christmas. He taught thousands of people. He healed the sick. Jesus also knew it was important to be with his friends, rest when he was tired, and celebrate when something exciting happened. So he did, just like us. And that's a part of God's story. How about that? I mean, think about it. Jesus was like you and me. Kids, however old you are watching this, Jesus was exactly your age. <laughs> but let's get back to our big question. Why was Jesus your age? Why did God's son come to earth as a human baby? Are you ready for the answer? Are you? Are you? It was so that he could show us that he understands us. Now think about this ravine again. There are two sides to it, separated by a great distance. That's sort of how humans are separated from God by our wrong choices. Now let's say this side is where God is and all the way over there is where humans are. Whew. I'm not running over there again. From this side, we can't really see what the ground is like way over there. So we don't know what people would have to deal with on that side. If there's a bunch of holes in the ground, or mud, or quicksand. Okay, hopefully not quicksand. The point is, if you were way on the other side, how could I trust that you understand what it's like to be on my side? Unless you found a way to come all the way to where I am. Or think about Minecraft again. If you only stay in creative mode, you don't know what it's like to be in survival mode. Always worrying about having enough or someone else coming to mess things up. If I was a character in your world and you were the one in control and then suddenly you appeared in survival mode as a character like me, that would blow my mind. I mean, you would be able to build bridges, which would be super helpful. And as the creator, you'd also be able to fix other things that were wrong with the world. You'd be in total control and you would have power over things like the weather. But as a character trying to survive, you'd also understand my pain, my worries, my anxieties, and my doubts. You'd know what it was like on my side because you would have built a bridge between your side and my side. Jesus connected both sides, kind of like how this bridge connects this side to that side. Now, Jesus came to earth to show us what God was really like, but he also came to show us that God understands us. That's what happened when Jesus came to earth as a human, starting as a baby and then experiencing life as a kid and then becoming an adult. God's son knew what it was like to be you. That's why it was so amazing in the first place. And that's why Jesus was able to do things that no one else was able to do. 
all the miracles and all those famous stories that I heard as a kid. Calming the storm, healing people who were sick, walking on water. He had all the power of God the Creator, but he also understood what it was like to be scared, worried, and lonely. He would even understand what it was like to feel pain and die. And he did all of it out of love. That's the real reason Jesus came to earth. Not just to fix things that were wrong, not just to perform miracles and show his power, not even just so that he could understand us. He came to show God's love. Remember that verse May told us about John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Why follow Jesus? Why should anyone follow Jesus? And if I do decide to follow Jesus, what should I expect? <laughs> hey, I'm Chris from Kids Club, and I gotta be honest with you, these questions are big. I mean, all the questions we've been asking are big. Why are we here? Why do bad things happen? Why did Jesus come to earth? But today's big question is like mega, epically huge. And it's an important question that billions of people have asked themselves and asked God and they found an answer. We're going to get to some of those answers in a bit, but you know who else can find an answer to that question? You, yes, you on the other side of the camera. If you don't hear anything else, I want you to hear this. The way you answer this question, why should I follow Jesus, can literally change your whole life. Now, the short answer to the question is because it's God's plan for you in this life and in the life to come. See, we're all going to die, and following Jesus means you can have eternal life, or go to heaven after you kick the bucket, or spend all the rest of forever with your Lord and Savior Jesus. Hold up, did Chris just say we're all gonna die? Allison, is that what you heard? Yeah, Mae, that's what I heard, that we're all gonna kick the bucket. Right, Andrew? Hey, May. Allison? How do you work this apple? Uh, John, Jen, a little help here. Oh, oh hey, hey Chris. Chris. Jinx. Jinx. Double, Double jinx. jinx. May, you started this whatever this is. What's the dealio? Well, you drop a doozy on us like we're all gonna die, and then you just move on like that wasn't just a big old ball of wax in our ice cream? Yeah, I mean, May's right. Like, you have to explain yourself. You have to give a little bit of fluff there. I knew this was gonna happen. You try to do something good, like tell kids why they should follow Jesus. Chris, it's just a little more complicated than that. All right, all right. Emergency online hangout. Okay, everyone here? Ready to begin? Kazoo's out. Oops, May, I forgot my kazoo. Can I borrow one of yours? Oh yeah, sure, Allison. Mm -hmm. All right. That one here. One, two, three. Whoa! Excellent. <laughs> Why, thank you so much. Right. I hereby call this meeting to order. <laughs> All right, May, you had an objection to talking to kids about death? Well, it's okay to talk about death. I mean, we all die, right? 
Yeah. 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 We do. That's true. But the fact that everyone dies isn't the greatest reason to follow Jesus. I mean, that's the short answer, but the slightly longer version is more complicated than that. Uh, huh? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. Believing in Jesus and following him means you get to get into heaven. But hopefully there's a lot of time between now and then. Yeah, there is so much life to live before that even happens. Exactly. Okay, so what's a better reason? Chris, I got an idea. Yeah, Jen, go for it. So all of us decided to follow Jesus, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we could have made other choices, like we could have decided that God doesn't even exist or that Jesus is just like Buddha or like a flying spaghetti monster or whatever. The point is, is that we decided to follow Jesus, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. So, Chris, why don't we have everybody share their story about why they decided to follow Jesus? Ooh, I like that, Jen. Time for some testimonies. Revelation 12, 11, they overcame the enemy by the blood of the lamb. And the word of their testimony. You see, there's probably a lot of different answers. And it is an important question. Well, what if we all took 30 seconds to answer the question? Well, I, I don't know if that's going to work. Yes. Part of following Jesus is learning to trust, right? So trust us. We got this. Right, team? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got this. All right. Um, oh, look, I trust you guys. Um, this actually sounds kind of fun, <laughs> actually. So, May, how about you go first? We'll start the timer and go. So I grew up in a family that went to church a lot, and the people at church didn't act very much like the Jesus that I was hearing about, which made it not so fun to go to church. But when I went away to college, I met some people who acted like Jesus, whether they were in church or at school, wherever they were, and it totally changed my life. I learned to love Jesus. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that was yeah. great. Uh, Andrew. How about you go next? When I was a kid, I was kind of a loner. I didn't feel like anyone really understood or wanted me around. And honestly, that just caused me to feel lonely all the time. And I didn't really know God when I was a kid. I guess my family talked about him from time to time, but it wasn't until I was in high school that I really jumped into a relationship with him. And he showed me just how present he really is. And that I'm never really alone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah totally. I love that. Hey, thank you, Andrew. Uh, John, how about you go? So when I was a kid, I actually liked going to church and learning about Jesus. Um, I loved God and I loved other people a lot. But as I got older, I didn't always feel like I fit in. I knew that God loved me, but there were times when I felt like some people didn't really like me. Um, I met people who understood me and who knew God. I still sometimes can have a hard time talking about the way that I'm feeling or about what I'm thinking, but I know there are people that I trust that will help me. John, thanks for sharing. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. That's awesome. Jen, how about you go? 30 seconds and go. Yeah, so my whole life, I always knew about Jesus. My family and I, we went to church every Sunday, and what I learned was that when I was good, Jesus loved me. And when I was bad, Jesus was mad at me. And since I wasn't good all the time, then I just kind of assumed that Jesus was always disappointed in me. When I got older, um, I started thinking, what if I just started asking Jesus who he is and have him tell me? So I know that might sound kind of weird, but what I learned is that God is good and that Jesus, he delights in me. And when I follow him, my life starts to look more and more like his. So I don't have to worry so much about being good or whether I'm bad. Instead, if I follow Jesus and I choose to obey him, then my life already starts looking more and more like his. Well, kind of like Jen, I grew up going to church too, but I felt like I always had to be perfect. I wanted to be the good kid and never make any mistakes or make any wrong choices. 
And my parents helped me see that Jesus loves me no matter what I do or how I mess up. And I realized that when I'm scared or lonely, or if I worry about whether other people like me or not, God is always with me, whether I fit in with other people or anything. Yeah. Awesome. That was amazing. Yeah. Guys, that was super sweet. I feel like I know each one of you a little bit better now. Thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing your stories. Look, if you're still with us, you've just heard some really amazing stories of why real people like you and me have decided to follow Jesus. And maybe that's enough of a why for you too. If that's you, if you're ready to say, I follow Jesus, then you should know this. We are so excited for you. And you're part of God's family because he's a good father. And your good father is also a good king. And so you're part of his kingdom. And normally, at this point, I'd say something like, let's watch this cool God story video that'll teach us about the kingdom. But the thing is, because of everything that's going on right now, we're not able to get into the office to animate that video yet. But God story kingdom is gonna be cool, we promise you, and when it's ready, we'll put it on our YouTube channel. In the meantime, we decided to try something a little different with this God story video. We went on Facebook and asked you, yes, you, watching right now, to help us out. We asked you to get creative, to draw pictures, to act things out in your homes, to do random acts of kindness and get it on camera. And you delivered. We're so proud of the kids, families, and volunteers in our community. But not just because we were able to make a really sweet, wonderful video. We're proud because this is what the kingdom looks like. This is what it looks like when people who follow Jesus put their beliefs into action. And so, for the first time ever, Kids Club presents a God Story video, and it's incomplete, the official version is still coming, that was completely created by you. Let's watch together. God Story Kingdom so part of God's story is about what Jesus called the kingdom. And it goes like this. When Jesus would teach people about God, he would tell them about God's kingdom. He would say God's kingdom is here or put God's kingdom first. That might be confusing to us today, especially if we live in a country that doesn't have a king. A kingdom is wherever the king is in charge. Kings can give commands and people in the kingdom obey those commands. So in God's kingdom, where God is in charge, people follow God's commands. And in the part of the Bible called the law, there are a lot of commands. It was kind of confusing. Even experts on the law would argue about which commands were more important than others. One day, some religious experts asked Jesus, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law? Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Love God with all your mind. Now that's what they expected Jesus to say. But then Jesus said, And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Everything that was written in the law and the prophets is based on these two commandments. Jesus was saying that if people choose to let God be in charge of their lives, then they'll show it by treating other people, their neighbors, with love. Because God loves everyone. People we know, like our family and friends, but also people we don't know, like strangers we've never even met. God even loves people who might seem like enemies. Jesus showed God's love by helping people. He healed people who were sick, and he spent time with people who other people didn't like. He even died to rescue everyone from all the times we've disobeyed God's laws. And he did it all to prove God's love. But God's kingdom didn't stop when Jesus died. Jesus came back to life and told his followers to spread God's kingdom throughout the entire world. And that's exactly what they did. See, Jesus had told them stories or parables to teach them about God's kingdom. Jesus said that the kingdom was like a tiny mustard seed that was planted in the ground and then grew and grew and grew until it became the biggest tree in the garden. And the birds that might have wanted to eat that tiny mustard seed 
could now build a nest in the mustard tree's branches. God's kingdom might seem really small at first, but it never stops growing. Jesus also said God's kingdom was like buried treasure that a man found in a field. Then when he realized how valuable the treasure was, he buried it again, sold everything he owned, and used the money to buy the whole field. Jesus was saying there's nothing more wonderful and good than to be in God's kingdom. The best news is God's kingdom isn't a place, like a field, or a building, or a country, that only certain people are allowed into. God's kingdom is wherever people love God and love other people. That means God's kingdom can be anywhere in the world and everyone can choose to be part of it. Wherever someone knows that every good thing they have comes from God and so they share what they have with others, that can be God's kingdom. Wherever someone knows that God has forgiven them for messing up and so they forgive someone else who's messed up too, that can be God's kingdom. Wherever someone learns about Jesus and tries to do the things that Jesus did, that can be God's kingdom too. And that's a little about God's kingdom. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Jesus talked about God's kingdom. The greatest commands are to love God and love people. Jesus showed what that looked like. The kingdom is like a mustard seed that grows into a tree. It's also like buried treasure. The kingdom is wherever people love God and love people. And that's a part of God's story. Now that's why you should follow Jesus. Because beautiful, amazing, awesome things are possible when people follow Jesus together. When they're generous, when they show love, when they use their creativity and gifts to help others. Thank you to everyone who was involved in the making of that video. Now, did you notice how much fun everyone seemed to be having? That's because following Jesus by loving God and loving other people can actually make you feel great. It can be fun to follow Jesus. And remember, you don't have to wait until you die and go to heaven for the fun to start. Jesus came and said the kingdom was here, right now. And it's a party where everyone is invited, no matter who you are, what you've done, what you look like, or where you live. See, that is another reason to follow Jesus. Your life right now, even if some stuff is messed up, can have meaning and joy and kindness and purpose and friendship and a lot of other really, really good things. Now, it doesn't mean you'll be perfect. I know I'm not. And it doesn't mean you won't have some hard times to go through. You might. And it also doesn't mean you have to stop asking big questions. It just means you can take those big questions to God. Remember Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those who come to God must believe that he exists. And they must believe that he rewards those who look to him. This also means that you get to have a good, good father and a powerful, powerful king. God, the same God who made you, loves you, understands you, and wants you to have an adventure with him. And that's why you should follow Jesus.